thank you for tuning in to the Beyond Hourly podcast hosted by Omni Bridgeway, one of the world's most experienced disputes funders and judgment enforcement specialists. Our podcast focuses on advancements in legal services that drive economic value for law firms and the clients they serve. Episodes of this podcast can be found on our website, www.omnibridgeway.com, iTunes, Spotify, and other podcast networks. We welcome you to subscribe to the podcast and leave us reviews. I'm your host, Stephanie Southwick. I'm an investment manager based in Omni Bridgeway's San Francisco office. Prior to joining Omni, I was the managing partner at a business and IP litigation boutique in Silicon Valley. My role at Omni involves assessing litigation investment opportunities generally and more specifically in the trade secrets space. Our guest today is Judge Carlos Bea. Judge Bea serves on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He was appointed by George W. Bush in 2003. Before his appointment to the Ninth Circuit, he was a trial judge on the San Francisco Superior Court. I will let him tell us about his practice before his years on the bench. Judge Bea, welcome to the Beyond Hourly podcast. I'm absolutely thrilled to be speaking with you today. So thank you for joining us. I wanted to start kind of at the beginning of your legal career because I'm always so interested in hearing how people ended up where they are in their careers. Some people choose very deliberate paths and others kind of seize opportunities as they arise. So would you please share with us your path to where you are now and maybe even what initially attracted you to the law? Well, I remember when I was 14 years old, I was involved in some litigation involving a custodian claim against her for taking money that she shouldn't have taken from the family. And we had a lawyer named John Froelich in Los Angeles, and I had to go and talk to him because I was going to be a witness. And he said, uh, you know, you really ought to think about becoming a lawyer. And I said, why, why is that? And he said, well, he says, every time the door opens, a new life walks in, and you get paid to solve people's problems. So I thought, that's a wonderful idea because it shows variety and it shows that I can use my whatever skills I have, and it's something that attracted me. So I decided quite early that I wanted to become a lawyer. But there was a time I thought maybe I wanted to become a psychiatrist because I heard the psychiatrists, especially in the hills, were paid more by the hour. <laughs> but I finally decided to become a lawyer. So then tailored my studies to that. So did you ever testify at 14? No, I only didn't have to testify at 14. I testified before that, but that's a chapter I'd rather not go into. Absolutely. All right. So you knew you wanted to be a lawyer. You went to law school. And where'd you go to law school? At Stanford. How'd you end up there? In, in those days, I was an undergraduate at Stanford. And I was playing on the basketball team at Stanford of my sophomore and junior years. But in those days, you could go to first year of law school at your senior year of undergraduate. And you could do both at the same time for one tuition. Right? So I decided to take advantage of that and do my senior year in undergraduate as my first year in law school. And I was able to continue playing on the basketball team during my first year of law school. So after you graduated from law school, what did you do? Well, when I graduated from law school, the first thing I had to do was take a trip back to Spain with my brother because we had matters in Spain that had to be taken care of. But then I came back to California and I didn't know whether I wanted to go to San Francisco or to Los Angeles to practice law. My brother lived in San Marino, close to Los Angeles. But one of my professors at Stanford, Urban Packer, was a wonderful man. He recommended I go to San Francisco, which I did. And so I called up the Stanford placement office and asked them if they knew of any vacancies among firms in San Francisco. And they gave me the name of one. And it was called Dun Dun and Phelps on Montgomery Street. And I went and I interviewed and they offered me a job and I took it. And so I became an associate at Dun Dun and Phelps in 1959. I had thought about going into tax practice, and Dun Dun and Phelps didn't do tax at all. What they did principally was defend jury cases, personal injury cases, for the Southern Pacific Company, the Western Pacific Railway, and other railway companies. And so they said, well, if you come here, you're going to be a trial attorney. So I said, well, that sounds like fun. So I said, great. And so I became an associate and I started learning about trying cases. And within a year, I was trying cases in Superior Court 
in San Francisco in the federal court first chair. So within your first year of practice, you first chaired a trial. Right. I tried the case in 1960. I went to work in 1959, and I tried the case in 1960. Pretty uncommon today, wouldn't you say? <laughs> well, how many trials do you think you tried over your career? Best guess. I've probably started trials. A lot of personal injury cases settle shortly after a case is assigned, mainly because in those days, the percentage which the plaintiffs took out of the settlement went up from 25% before the case went to trial to 33% when the case went to trial. You mean the plaintiff's attorney's contingency fee? Right. So somehow always settled not before the case was called for trial. Isn't that amazing? So I probably started 80 or 100 cases and probably tried to a conclusion 40, 50. But then I started 1960 and I tried cases until 1989 actually 1990, so 30 years of trial. And I tried mostly in Superior Court in San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Humboldt, Sacramento, a lot of places. And district court was not as likely because in the district court, you had a unanimous jury and the plaintiff's attorneys wanted a nine to three jury. Once in a while, we tried. To, I tried a case in this, in this courthouse in 1962 when the district court was in its courthouse in seventh mission. So you were a trial attorney for almost 30 years. So you must have enjoyed it. I love trying cases. What do you love about trying cases? It's a little bit like a theatrical production where the attorney is a script writer, an actor, a critic, and a producer. So you have various roles to fulfill when you're trying a case. I always thought that it was very interesting, if not amusing, to try cases and prepare them for trial. I like preparing cases for trial as much as actually trying, preparing strategies that witnesses emphasize. And I found it very interesting work. Long hours, hard work, early mornings, late nights, but it was fun. So why the change? Why did you move? Well, I'll tell you what, what happened. In 1989, I'd left Dun Phelps and Mills, Dun Dun and Phelps became Dun Phelps and Mills, and I left it in 1975 and started my own practice. So for the last, say, 15 years, I was a solo practitioner, but I had employees, I had associate attorneys, I had maybe two or three at a time. So I was trying cases, doing my work, and then one of my friends, who was a friend of the governor of California, Duke Major, asked me to lunch and showed me a list of people who had put their names forward to be Superior Court judges. And he wanted to see if I had any comments about any of them, about their reputations, about their abilities. So we were having lunch. He showed me the list. And I went through the list and I said, well, Richard, undoubtedly each one of these people, when they arrive home after work in the evening, are recognized by the dog. But nobody else has ever heard of them. Who are these bozos, right? I've been trying cases for over 20 years, and I've never heard of any of these folks. Who are these guys? So I said, okay, wise guy, what about you? You want to be a judge? So at that time, I was married, we had two children, and I called my wife. I said to her, propositions that made to me, do I want to be a Superior Court judge? And she said, do Superior Court judges work on Saturdays and Sundays like you do? And I said, no, they don't. She said, take the job. We've got a lot of Little League games to go to. Mm -hmm. And it could be better for the family. So that convinced me. So I became a Superior Court judge. Within eight days of becoming a Superior Court judge, I got a call from the county clerk that I was being opposed in the upcoming election, the ratification election. And I had been appointed by a Republican governor. I had been a member of the Republican State Central Committee. And I was fairly cognizant of Republican politics. And I was being run against by a woman who sat on the Democratic Central Committee in San Francisco and was a self-proclaimed lesbian. So that was the campaign I was faced with eight days after becoming a judge and having closed my law office. Yes, right. And there I was. Eight days later, oh my. Campaign for four months. And we wouldn't be talking about it if I hadn't won the campaign. Right. But I had support from persons who were not Republicans in San Francisco, principally 
people like John Burton and Willie Brown supported me. And I got labor unions to support me. And I won the election 59 to 41. Nobody ever ran against me after. <laughs> well, I'm sure you didn't think you were signing up for a campaign at the time. Well, as a matter of fact, when they offered me the job in Sacramento, the governor's appointment secretary said, we're offering you the job. Would you accept it? And I said, do I have to defend myself in an election next year? And he looked at the calendar. He said, yes, that's a possibility. Then I said, I can't give you an answer until I talk to somebody else. So he said, you don't have to talk to anybody else. I'm authorized to offer you the job. You don't have to talk to the governor. I'm authorized to give you the job. I said, that's not the point. I've got to talk to Billy Brown to see if he will be in my corner if I'm run against. So I went upstairs to the office of the Speaker of the Assembly, which is Willie, who I'd known for some years. And I said, would you support me against the field? Somebody runs against me against anybody who runs against me. And he said, sure. So then I went back downstairs and I told the governor's appointment secretary to take the job. Well, that was very smart of you. You know, what's impressive to me is to hear that, you know, you were a Republican or are a Republican, but you have friends across the aisle. And I think that is rare these days. Do you think it was less rare back then? Or was that just something that you cultivated or just happened? Well, when I first got to San Francisco, I met lawyers on both sides, both plaintiffs and defense lawyers. And I always got along well with plaintiffs' lawyers. I was doing nothing but defense in those days. And I joined groups such as the American Board of, of Trial Advocates, which have a diplomat because you have to try a certain amount of cases. Mm-hmm. And, and I got along with all of them. And that sort of continued over the years. If you take a look outside, there's a wall hanging of the Senate vote when my name came up for the Senate confirmation. 86 to zero. So I've always gotten along well with Democrats and Republicans. And plaintiffs' attorneys. (laughs) Well, they keep the defense attorneys in business. So when you went out on your own, did you suddenly have to become a business person as well? I mean, that's one thing that's always interesting to me when lawyers open their own firms. They're suddenly running a business and a law practice, right? Yes, it was a different way of practicing law than doing it in a law firm. On the other hand, it had the advantage of not having to go to partners' meetings. Right. You can make all the decisions yourself. Right. Nothing's by committee anymore. Interesting. Well, one of the things I find so fascinating about your career is that it's just so varied, right? You were an associate at a firm. Were you a partner at Ben Denifel? About six years after I went to work. Wow. So you were a partner at a firm. You went to the partnership meeting. You started your own firm. Then you were a trial judge. And now you're on the Ninth Circuit. So you've seen so many different facets of our industry. And I think that's really interesting. And I'm wondering, you know, from that perspective, do you have any kind of overarching thoughts about the legal profession? I imagine you're going to say you love it because it sounds like you loved all the different parts of your career. But any other kind of thoughts about it or advice you would give to people considering going to law school these days? Well, first of all, law school is not easy. It's difficult. It's long hours. It's hard work. And the idea of going to law school because you don't know what else to do, I don't recommend it. Working as a lawyer, especially what I know as a trial lawyer, can be intensive, hard, exacting work. So I don't recommend it just anybody. These days, I think lawyers probably earn much more money than they did when I first started. And so they live better. The idea of lawyers earning two or three million dollars a year, as some partners do in large law firms, that would never happen in 1960. The thing that I've seen sort of, I find dispiriting, is how expensive litigation has become. And it's perfectly clear that our litigation system, state and federal, is in a certain sense a market failure because what's happened is that the arbitration industry has caught up and arbitration advertises itself as being much cheaper and much faster and much easier to navigate than civil litigation system. And I think the big reason why that's so is because in the late 1940s and early 50s, the people who make the federal rules of civil procedure were, I think, naively taken by the idea of open discovery. 
discovery has become a devouring beast that makes civil litigation very difficult for anybody but very financially heavyweight contenders. So that is something I, I think is, is a problem. I mean, I, I think it's marvelous to be able to take depositions of adverse witnesses. And I don't mean to crimp down on that aspect of it. But the document production has become, I would say, a paper industry, except they don't use paper anymore. But it just takes ungodly amounts of time and causes young, bright lawyers who've left these chambers and gone into big firms and work 10 to 12 hours a day in document review and get handsomely paid, call me up in two or three years and say, Judge, can you get me a job with the public defender's office or the district attorney's office or the U.S. attorney's office? Because I can't take this anymore. It's a dispiriting landscape in big law futures. I would still become a lawyer if I were getting out of law school. I still want to become a trial lawyer. But I think I'd probably choose someplace other than a big city, such as San Francisco or L.A. I might choose Boise, Idaho, Laramie, Wyoming, or Billings, Montana, to practice law. Because the type of law that's practiced at a very high level, but it's exhausting and it's not made for the ordinary business entity. You know, we, of course, at Omni Bridgeway, fund claimants who could not otherwise afford to litigate um, if they're going up against a big company and they just don't have the resources to do it. We understand that completely, right? And discovery, and we're looking at budgets all the time. And coming from a smaller firm, I mean, my firm, we were about 13 attorneys. And to look at some of the budgets we see, it's really amazing how expensive some of this litigation is. And a big chunk of it is discovery, of course. And fights over discovery, right? Fights over discovery. Right. Now, of course, when I started practice, a firm such as yours would be criminally prosecuted under champerty maintenance and rules that, that were in effect in those days. The idea of somebody financing a claim and taking a percentage of the claim was anathema. Of course, in those days, lawyers didn't advertise either. Right. So the, the whole panorama of the practice of the law has changed. It was much more quiet, maybe genteel. You have to go to the right clubs and the right meetings and the right evening sessions of the Bar Association to make yourself known and get clients. There wasn't an internet. You couldn't advertise. You couldn't take out full-page ads like I've seen, right? So it's become more of a business now and less of a professional. Yeah. And do you have any strong opinions about litigation finance? If I may ask. No, I think that I come from a free market background. To me, the idea of litigation finances is simply a rational investment tool. It may promote more litigation than otherwise would occur. But on the other hand, it may vindicate some claims that otherwise wouldn't be brought. So I, I'm totally neutral on the, uh, on the issue. Mm -hmm. So I said I was going to ask you about basketball. I did not play team sports. I was a classically trained ballet dancer. I have no team sport perspective, but I've heard many lawyers say that they learned, you know, fundamental aspects of lawyering playing team sports. And I've seen a lot of lawyers, you know, looking for that in resumes, especially for litigators, because there's this impression that there's, you know, a toughness, a strength that comes with playing team sports. Do you subscribe to that, or did you learn anything? I started playing team sports when I was 11, 12, playing tackle football at the military school I was in. Right? In those days, we had leather helmets and didn't have face masks. It was a, an entry into conflict. <laughs> entry into conflict. I like it. <laughs> and, uh, so then I started playing basketball. When you play for teams that shouldn't win, but do win, it gives you the idea that you can go up against anyone. And that's been my attitude ever since. I mean, at Stanford, we didn't have the ability to recruit the people that went to USC and UCLA. But if we beat them, I felt pretty good about it. <laughs> right, I'm sure. Now, if I'm correct, you played for a few other teams. 
your high school team in Stanford, but I think you played for a few other teams as well. Before I played for Stanford, after high school, I played at university high school, home to three Ninth Circuit Court judges, Judge Reinhardt, Judge Fisher, and me, right? We were all at the same time, of course, the other two have already died. After high school, I played at Menlo JC for one year. And then, because I was a Cuban citizen, my father was a Cuban, born in Cuba. And although I was born in Spain, I had Cuban citizenship through him. And my brother, who traveled down to Cuba to see an uncle who was there, said, why don't you go out for the Cuban Olympic basketball team? What year is this? This is 1951, just before the 52 Olympics. So I said, well, I had a pretty good year as a freshman at Menlo JC. I chose on the all-league team, you know, set a scoring record and all sorts of stuff. So I wrote a letter with some press clippings and sent it down to basketball coach of the Olympic team in Havana. And I got a letter back saying, you don't have to worry about trying out your own team. So I said, hooray. And that was a sophomore at Stanford by this time. And I was redshirt and I wasn't playing with Stanford varsity. I was 17, so I was a sophomore. I skipped a couple of grades. So then I went down to Havana to join the team. Had you been to Cuba before? Oh, I'd been in Havana before, yeah. I went to school in Havana for two years in the early 40s. And then I visited my uncle down there a couple of times. So that was, I'd been around Havana quite a bit. So then we finally procured the funding to go to Helsinki. But we got the money. The team went to Helsinki to play in the 1952 games. And I was a starting center on the team. We got in the final round of 16 teams. We won two and lost one and we got in the final round. But I have to say that after we got in the final round, the next four games we lost. So we actually went two and five. And I don't consider myself very much of an Olympic athlete. I consider myself more of an Olympic tourist. <laughs> our son, Sebastian, our firstborn son, is a real Olympic athlete. He rode for the USA in the Sydney Games in 2000 and won a silver medal. So he was the stroke on the men's pair. And then after getting back to after Helsinki, I went down to spend the summer with my uncle who'd come over from Cuba. And he said, why don't we go down to Madrid and see some of your relatives? So I said, fine. And I had no recollection of anything about Spain because I left there when I was five. So we drove down to Madrid, and Madrid was a beautiful place. I was very impressed. It was sort of a small Paris, and Paris is marvelous. So then I asked around, and by this time I was 18, but I was going back to Stanford. And I asked around, and they said, well, why don't you talk with the Real Madrid football club, soccer team? Because they've got a basketball team, and they're the national champions, and you might want to talk to them. So I did, and they said they wanted me to play for them for a year. So instead of going back to Stanford, I spent a year in Madrid in 1952-53, 18-19, and had a simply marvelous time. Basketball in Spain in those days was very rudimentary. There was only one wood floor in all of Spain, and that was in the bullring in Barcelona. And you had to play at night because it was too hot during the day. So... Every place else, if you were lucky, you got to play on concrete. And concrete in part, because we used to play in high alive frontones. Oh, sure. The best game. The edge of the basketball court would be cork. So you'd be dribbling the ball on concrete, and then you'd start dribbling the ball on cork, which bound it differently. <laughs> uh, so, and then we played outdoors, and we played on gravel. And we played in snow. So it was sort of heroic era of playing basketball in Spain. And it was a great deal of fun. Then I went back to Stanford and joined the Stanford team varsity and played there for three years. And I happen to know that you still make it back to Spain on occasion. Yes, the last couple of years because of COVID. COVID. But uh, we have the house I was born in is still in the family. And my brother and I used to go there. My brother died, but he has five boys, or he had five boys. And we have four boys. And so we go there in the summertime and sort of have family reunions. Lovely. And is your first son, Sebastian, named after San Sebastian? Yep. Yeah. It's also a family name. But... Right. So what do you think makes a good trial attorney? First of all, he's got to have a sense of 
we're talking about trial training for jurors, right? Yes. Do you have a sense of what is credible? What can he sell the jury? When he gets that, then he has to do some imaginative work in figuring out how to shape the witnesses and the documents and the other evidence to fulfill the story he wants to tell the jury, the credible story regarding the incident or the situation that's involved. I think what makes a good trial attorney is somebody who's willing to think originally about means of production of evidence, but keeping in mind that the ultimate audience for the evidence is going to be the jury, and the jury may not be as adept at understanding all the interstices of the case. So he's got the, as I said earlier, script writer, producer, director, and player it has to put it all together. So that's, I think, what makes a good trial attorney. And the ability to think afresh about issues and sort of invent ways to bring something new into the case. Let me give you an example. When I was starting, and for some years, when I was trying cases for the defense in railroad cases, normally if we had a plaintiff who had an injured leg or an arm, we'd send him to get to have medical examination. We'd have him sent to an orthopod or a neuroscience, neurological doctor. And he'd be seen, and we'd get a, a medical report as to what his condition was. And the doctor would see him for an hour and maybe talk to him a bit. And that would be about all the exposure we'd get. So that would be what we'd use as a defense to the claims of the plaintiff. And it struck me that, that this was really not enough because we'd get people who had a broken ankle and couldn't return to being conductors on the railroad because they couldn't walk on any even ground. And they could do a lot of other things, but the railroad was structured with a union structure, and they couldn't get them from one job to another easily. Right? You'd end up having to pay a lot of money when you knew that the man had the physical functional capacity and could do other work, but we just couldn't get him a job. We didn't know what that functional capacity was. Couldn't assess it by one hour with an orthopedic surgeon. Right? So I got the idea that if I could get the plaintiff to go to a rehabilitation clinic and be seen for three days, not one hour, three days, and be given all sorts of intelligence tests and other tests regarding his personality and give him a physical test to see how he did different things, we could get a rehabilitation expert. Some people think that, along with Mark Twain, that an expert witness is a prevaricator a long way from home. But that's not necessarily true. I decided to make a motion in San Francisco Superior Court for medical examination. And the place there, he said, I'll give you a medical examination. What do you want me to send them? I said, no, no, I want a three-day medical examination in a place that happened to be a case in Fresno, in Fresno. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, well, I'm going to bring a motion. So I went and made a motion and convinced Judge Ira Brown, who was then the law and motion judge, and was famous for answering a question about what was the proper judicial demeanor by saying, proper judicial demeanor, demeanor the better. <laughs> I said to him, Judge, I want to get a real assessment of this plaintiff's residual functional capacity because he's going to be able to prove that he can't be a conductor anymore and that he can't do any other work for the rest of his 40 years of a work life. Right? And I think he can, and I don't know what that is, but I've got experts who will test him and come back and tell us what he can do. And I convinced the judge, and he, and he ordered it. I started doing that over and over again, and other people started doing it. And we got a much more rounded picture of the man's possibility as far as work-life expectancy and what jobs he could do. Oh, that's a very practical approach, right? Well, it was. And creative. Yeah, it worked out fine. Sometimes the plaintiff's attorneys didn't like it. And so they would say they would oppose the, the motion. And I would tell Judge Brown, I understand perfectly why they're opposing it. The plaintiff's attorney is on a contingency contract and can share in the plaintiff's newfound wealth, but he can't share in his health. Or his job for the next 40 years, <laughs> right. And we had some good re rehabilitation experts. Some of them were people who had suffered injuries themselves 
and had overcome those injuries and gone into a profession which was a rehabilitation expert. And they were marvelous witnesses because they'd come to court and they'd be more injured than was the plaintiff. Right. So what about appellate attorneys? What do you think makes a good appellate attorney? Very different skills, obviously. The best appellate argument that you can possibly give is to stand up and say to the court, are there any questions? It shows confidence and it shows that you're ready to talk about any aspect of the case that might be in the back of any question that the judge might have. That's done very seldom because it takes a great deal of expertise to know the case inside and out and know the judges inside and out and be able to, with confidence, have a conversation with them saying, do you have any problems with awarding judgment in my favor? And if you do, tell me what they are. Let's have them out right now. That's what I used to do mm-hmm. when I did a pellet argument. I did very seldom pellet argument. But that's my view. There aren't many lawyers who spend that much time knowing the record backwards and forwards and the cases that they're citing so that they have the confidence and the skill and the wit to make such an argument. But that's the best argument I can think of. Right. And what if there are no questions? Then the confidence to sit down? Yeah. Maybe okay. Questions? Thank you very much for having, for having me here. Good afternoon. I agree. There are probably not many attorneys that can do that. Oh, I could name it. They're really top flight and exude that sort of confidence in their case. Sometimes one can zero in on the appellate case on one issue, and the confident and able appellate counsel will say, there are many issues in this case, but most of them can be taken care of in the briefs. But there's this one issue here that is really somewhat unsettled, and I'd like to discuss the case, that issue with you. Right? And then you engage the mind of the judges on that one issue, and you show that you're ready to discuss all aspects of the issue. And you court questions, always court questions. So a good appellate attorney will court questions all the time and never give a set speech. Mm, not a fan of the set speech. No. Sometimes it's useful to say, I'd like to talk about three issues here, but I won't talk about the two if you tell me that one is the one that's interesting to you. And these are the three issues I think that have to be discussed. But please guide me by your questions as to what you consider still an issue here. That is my idea of the good appellate argument. Well, I think that's great for the practitioner, too, because, you know, sometimes when you're arguing motions, for example, in trial court, and you just have no idea what the judge is thinking about the briefs, it's really hard to present a targeted argument. Something not in evidence that he's thinking about the brief. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. You can't be sure that he's read the brief. Right? That's very it's, true. The law clerk may have read it and passed him a memorandum, and he may have seen the first two paragraphs. But you can't be sure, especially in, in motion and trial practice. You've got to be very practical about what you're asking and immediately point out at whatever weak spots you have and say, the other side is pointing to these, and I'm ready to discuss them. They have to say something, so I'll tell you why they're, they're wrong, but I'm here to discuss it. Yeah, right. So I have a question. If you had not become a lawyer, what do you think your career would have been? Well, some sort of business, I suppose. I have engaged in business while being a lawyer. I've engaged in stock market investments. My brother and I founded and put together and ran a company which manufactured reinforced concrete pipe for uh, Los Angeles County Flood Control and other entities. My brother and I put together a mini storage, which is still in business. So I probably would have gone into one of those things because I, I like business. Well, the law turned out well for you after all, right? <laughs> well, I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you very much. Any other questions you want? We've got plenty of time today. Did you ever do any criminal work? I was wondering. I tried two cases, two criminal cases. Both of them misdemeanors. They were felonies. One I got an acquittal and the other was a hung jury. So uh, I did some criminal work. And then, of course, the first case I ever argued in the Ninth Circuit, it was a criminal case. In 1959, senior partner at Dunn, Dunn & Phelps called me and said, 
I've had a call from the clerk of the Ninth Circuit. They're looking for pro bono attorneys, and you volunteer. So I came down here, and I had a case involving a man who had shot up a bar in Alaska, in Anchorage, Alaska, which was then a territory. It wasn't a state. So I had his appeal. I knew nothing about criminal law, and I knew nothing about how to get a record together. I came to the Ninth Circuit, and the clerk, in those days, down the bottom of the first floor, there was a nice area with a fireplace, and fireplaces used to work. And he'd say, well, he said, you've come to the right place. You want to find out how to get a record pro bono? And so I had to figure out how to do that. And so I did, and I got a record. And when I did that, the clerk came and saw me and said, you know, that worked pretty well. Do you mind if we copy what you've done and hand it out to the other folks? There you go. And how did the appeal turn out? My appeal did not work out. He was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon for shooting up a bar because he was miffed with his former partner who had 86 and told him to leave the bar. So he came back and shot bottles up. I didn't have much to talk about. Not the most sympathetic. <laughs> but, uh, but I thought that the only thing I could, I could figure out was that the instructions didn't say that an assault, criminal assault, required the element of specific intent to harm. In those days, we didn't have the Internet. So I went over to the city hall and they had a library with all the state reports. And so I started going through the state reports and finding states which required the element in assault with a deadly weapon, criminal assault of specific intent to harm, not just general intent to cause an assault. And so I put together a brief and I argued the case and I lost it. And the Ninth Circuit published an opinion. And so then I wrote to my client and said, look, I could make a motion for in-bank hearing and petition for certiorari. And he'd gotten five years. And uh, he said, no, no, you've done enough work for me. I'll do it five years. And I'm sure you had to hear criminal cases as a trial judge. Yes, I was in City Hall and I got a call from the, from the presiding judge, Ed Stern, and he said, I'm sending you down to the Hall of Justice at 850 Bryant Street. I said, well, that's fine, but I don't have very much experience in criminal law. So why are you sending me down there? He said, well, your pal Jack Berman needs someone to have lunch with. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down to the Hall of Justice for a couple of years and tried all sorts of cases of murders and assaults and all that sort of stuff. And it was quite different from civil practice, quite different. That was what I was going to ask. First of all, the trials were shorter. It was almost unconstitutional to try a case for more than four days. So every case went down, 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 down. And I enjoyed it. I was down there for about two years. I remember one time I remarked to, we used to have motions to revoke before court started Motions to revoke be at 8.45, and the court started at 9, and we have these motions to revoke it out of the... Uh, Excuse me, what's a motion to revoke? A motion to revoke probation. Okay. And if a man was on probation, they caught him doing something else, and mm -hmm. so that violated the term of probation, and so the question was, do we send him back to prison, or do we continue probation? So they'd have the motions to revoke at 8.45, and the defendants would come out of the holding cell in their orange outfits. And I commented to the bailiff, I said, these men who come out of motions to revoke, most of them seem to be Catholic because they're always wearing a rosary over their yellow jumpsuits. And he said to me, come with me, judge. And he took me down to the holding cell, and there was a little hook with a rosary on it. And whoever was going out to see Judge Bea, who was Spanish, right, and a good Catholic, would wear a rosary over his head. They were on to you. <laughs> it was their costume, I see. So yeah. the next time I saw one of these lads with a rosary, with a public defender there, I said, I'm impressed. I think it's a good idea for people who just perform their lives to have contact with religion. And I noticed that the defendant is wearing a rosary. And I think that that's a sign of along the way of reform and getting right with society. But on the other hand, if I were to learn that this was simply facade and they were playing what they might think I like, right, I would consider that to be sacrilegious. And if somebody was doing something sacrilegious, I'd probably come down harder on them than I would otherwise. So the next time I see someone wearing a rosary, 
I'm going to ask them to recite for me the sorrowful and joyful mysteries of the rosary. And if they don't know them, then I'll think that he's just trying to put me on. Oh, boy. I stopped seeing the rosary. <laughs> wow. That's fascinating. What about civility in the profession? I have heard many lawyers from, you know, generations before mine say that lawyers used to be much nicer to each other and to their opposing counsel. I'm in an inn of court. I mean, that's the whole mission of the inn. And so I'm wondering if you have any perspective on that. Civility is very important. It raises the tone of the conflict and it allows you to deal with people over and over again without getting angry. In the judicial area, we call it civility collegiality. And a newspaper reporter once asked me, there seemed to be a great deal of collegiality in the Ninth Circuit as opposed to other circuits where some of the judges don't even meet with each other because they can't stand each other. And I told the newspaper reporter, I said, don't make the mistake of confusing collegiality with the necessary lubricant of society, which is good manners. Mm-hmm. I think civility and good manners are very important. And the British are very good at this. Mm-hmm. And they always refer to opposing counsel as my learned friend. It allows you to work with people with whom you are in conflict over and over again and get to the real issues or the real determinants of the case rather than move off in a huff. So I think it's very important. Have you observed, and maybe you don't observe this because all the attorneys you see are probably on their very best behavior, but have you seen a breakdown of that or not so much? I think attorneys are pretty well behaved and deal with each other respectfully, much more so at the appellate level than at the trial level. The trial level, think it sometimes out of hand, calling each other names and epithets and things like that. But normally attorneys, especially in front of juries, juries don't appreciate attorneys calling each other terrible things. I mean, they might think it's funny, but they won't put much value in a person who is constantly upbraiding his motivations of his opponent. So how has COVID affected things at the Ninth Circuit? Well, last year's clerks, because we just had new clerks come in just last week. Last year's clerks, I have four of them, and two of them couldn't come to San Francisco in time. And so they were stuck, one in Washington and one in Florida. We have weekly status meetings. We go through the inventory of cases, and we've been doing that by Zoom. I haven't noticed any slowdown in the handling of cases. Most of my contact with clerks is in writing because I'm a great believer in precision. And some judges like to have clerks in and discuss cases. I seldom do that, do things by writing back and forth. And... The computer is wonderful because I can get something from a clerk and then I can answer in a different color print exactly what I think about each thing as we go along. The cases, the hearings of the cases have been done by Zoom. The attorneys appear by Zoom. And I don't think we've had any sort of breakdown in the way we determine cases. We've had some very interesting cases that have been handled by Zoom as they would have been if we heard them in in, in courtroom one. So I don't think the product of the Ninth Circuit has been affected by COVID. Although from another angle, you could say, well, then how do you explain that of 16 cases seen by the Supreme Court in the 2020 term, 16 Ninth Circuit court cases, 15 of them were reversed. I don't think that that has to do with Zoom. And I don't think it has to do with COVID. We might have to do with something else, especially since eight of them were nine to nothing. Yeah. We, we had a hand spanked. Mm-hmm. Probably had nothing to do with COVID. Yeah. So, yeah, did you find that the hearings just as effective over Zoom as if they were in? Yes, and, and the fact of the matter is, in a, in a circuit as big as ours, I think this, we may find that the travel is cut down. I mean, why should attorneys fly out to Honolulu or up to Anchorage or to to Seattle, they're in Arizona. I think we're going to see more and more cases, even when we go back to sitting in in hearings, where the attorneys request to be heard on Zoom. 
it hasn't happened much in the past. And there's only one judge I know who, because of physical disabilities, can't travel and always appears by television or by Zoom. It has introduced a different way of trying, seeing cases, and a much cheaper way. I was just going to say, going back to our earlier conversation about the costs of litigation. Now, the strange thing is so some judges have asked for permission to travel to the courthouse to have a Zoom hearing. Now, let that sink in. For <laughs> travel to the courthouse. With their clerks. To have a Zoom hearing. To have a Zoom hearing with the attorneys. That, to me, seems like injudicious worth mm-hmm. of money. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know if I said this earlier, but the Daily Journal named you the most interesting man on the Ninth Circuit. And I understand why. I mean, you've had a really fascinating life and lots of adventures. And we haven't even talked about all of them, but are there a few things in particular that you think really shaped you as a lawyer or a judge, some of your experiences? As a trial lawyer, the partners at Dun Dun and Phelps, who were terrific people, shaped me a great deal because in those days there was no such thing as trial advocacy courses in law school. I later taught trial advocacy at Hastings and Stanford, but in those days there wasn't any of that. So you passed the bar and you'd never been in a courtroom in your life and you were supposed to be a trial lawyer, right? Well, those men would school me by going over carefully the pleadings and the investigative file And then I would sit in on their preparation for depositions of our witnesses and their preparation for adverse witnesses. And so I got a lot of schooling. I don't know how, if that's done anymore, because the hourly rates of attorneys are so high that it's hard to justify to a client that this attorney were charging $350 for, we're teaching them how to take a deposition. A client will say, teach them on your own time, pal. Absolutely. So I, I was a great benefit or a great deal from that type of teaching when I started out. Then when I went to, down to the uh, Hall of Justice when I was a rookie judge, I benefited tremendously by going to lunch with the judges at the Garden Cafe and telling them about the cases that I had and the sentences. And sentencing was so complex, California and still is that it takes a very seasoned judge to tell you what are the penalties for each crime and what are the enhancements and how there's an interplay and how there's a cutoff for too many years. Those things are very valuable. That experience that comes from people who've been there before is very valuable. I've always been interested in advocacy at Stanford. I was on my partner and I were the Stanford Wood Court team went all over the country arguing cases in the intercollegiate uh, competitions. That helps, too, because you have to, in those competitions, very often, you're the appellant one week and you're the appellee the next. So you have to think fast on your feet and change your tune. But we're paid to change our tunes. Right. And to think through your opponent's arguments, even if you're not changing your tune, right? I mean... I did have some notes I was going to ask you what makes a good trial judge and a good appellate judge, but I don't know if you want to talk about that. If you, if you do, I'd love to ask that. Well, I think what makes a good trial judge is having been a, a good trial attorney. I'm very much in favor of the British system of choosing judges from barristers, mm-hmm. people who've been there. And that goes also for appellate judges. But it isn't always true because of the way that judges are picked. Some of our colleagues here on the Ninth Circuit before they became judges, perhaps visited a courthouse on a dose of tour, but otherwise they didn't know where plaintiff sat or where the defendant sat in a trial courtroom. So I think you should choose judges and people who've tried cases. Now, on the appellate court, maybe that's not as important as on the trial court because you're dealing mostly with issues of law and you're not regulating the proof of facts. But in the trial court, it's very important. But on the appellate court, it's also important to have some experience in trial. Let me give you an example. One of the cases that I think I did good work on was a case called Hinkson versus USA. Hinkson probably is the case in the Ninth Circuit that's most cited, maybe 800 or 900 times since I wrote it in 2005 or 2009, whatever. 
And what it is, it's, it's a case that holds what the clear error test is on appellate review. And with respect to issues of law, it can be clear error and review de novo to see whether the trial judge got the law wrong. But on questions of fact, the scope of review is reduced to allow clear error to be found when the decision is illogical, implausible, or has no basis in fact in the record, right? which requires court finding an error to point out what the error is and show it in the record. Right? The prior rule was it's clear error if we have a firm conviction that error was made, a firm and definite conviction that error was made, which is totally subjective. I was in favor of an appellate fact-finding scope of review, which recognized that as to the facts found, the trial judge was in a much better situation than we were because he'd seen the witnesses right? and seen the attorneys in the presentation. We had a cold record. So if it wasn't jumping off the page as being illogical, implausible, or without factual basis from which to infer the record, then we deferred to the trial judge. And it was really an exercise in the allocation of power between the trial judge and the appellate judge. And what I was trying to do was to readjust the subjective standard, which allowed Ninth Circuit Court judges to say, I have a firm and indefinite conviction that an error was made, without saying what the error was, right? Wow. To having an objective test saying logical, implausible, impossible to infer from the record, and pointing out what that was. That is, right. So therefore, it makes the trial, the appellate court work a little harder because it gives more power to the trial judge. But that's where I think the power should be from my experience as a trial attorney and an appellate judge. Right, right. Although trial judges do get it wrong sometimes, right? They do. And But but I think that yeah. and they the do. standards allows for... Yeah. And judges get it wrong, don't forget. Ninth <laughs> Circuit Court, 15 out of 16. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's really interesting to think about. Oh, did you do you think that there was a reduction in appeals after that decision? There has been a decrease in appeals, but there's been a lot of decrease in reversals of the trial court. I think I haven't run any numbers on it, but the idea of deferring to the trial judge on issues of fact, unless you can point out something illogical, impossible, impossible to infer from the record, has stopped a lot of cases from being reversed where the case may be sympathetic, but we're not in the business of distributing sympathy. Judge Bay, I want to thank you again for appearing on OmniBridgeway's Beyond Hourly podcast and sharing your knowledge. Judge Bea, I want to thank you again for appearing on OmniBridgeway's Beyond Hourly podcast and sharing your knowledge. As I mentioned at the outset, episodes of the Beyond Hourly podcast can be found on our website, www.omnibridgeway.com iTunes, Spotify, and other podcast networks. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, I'd like to thank our audience for listening in and invite you to subscribe to the podcast and leave us reviews. Please feel free to follow up with me, Stephanie Southwick, at ssouthwick at omnibridgeway.com for any feedback, ideas, or insights you have on topics we should cover on the podcast. Thank you all and be well. Be well.